Okay, so um, unfortunately, uh, with our um, recent uh, lecture, re revision lecture for the Year 12 exam, this is 2014, um, only part of that ended up recording, which is a bit of a problem. So what I'll end up doing is uh, cutting this presentation maybe into three or four parts and, and presenting them fully. So they should end up being a bit longer. Um, hopefully this is a better resource for you so that you can actually sit through and then you can stop it at any slides that you like. Um, and also you can re-hear anything that you need uh, to take further notes on. So um, yeah, so I thought I'd start with this particular one because I think it's an area that needs the most work uh, in terms of our um, ability to tackle essay topics and what's presented as um, hopefully from the assessor's perspective, new material or something for you to think about uh, that is new in the exam. So for this one, um, this section will all cover um, how to construct a point of view. And I make it very general in that way because this is generally speaking about how to construct a point of view. To give a really really small um, synopsis of the philosophical construction of a point of view. You need two things to construct a point of view. You need reason or rationale and you need um, evidence. Or, uh, they're two kinds of ways of knowing. So one way of knowing is through logic and one another way of knowing is through experience. Um, ra rationalism and empiricism are those two particular things. So this actually um, plays out in the way that you construct your essay. Um, and I guess we are all rationalists uh, when it comes to constructing an essay because the most important thing in, uh, or the primary thing in an essay uh, regarding the construction of logic is reason. And that reason is seen in probably three different areas um, in this order. It's seen in the contention it's seen in your topic sentences, which is where you put your argument, and it's seen in the explanation of your evidence. So that all of those three things are um, the use of logic and use of critical thinking to convey your perspective. I believe contentions, oh, sorry, arguments, if you really want to get philosophical, should be a priori um, analytic, and the um, explanation should be a priori synthetic, if I've got the Kantian model correctly. Anyway, stop boring you with philosophy and we'll get on to the point. So um, I'm going to look at contentions first and there's some pretty clear and obvious mistakes that we're making with contentions uh, and I'm going to address those and I'm going to showcase you maybe some bad ones and I'm going to showcase you maybe how to improve those and make them better. So. Um, the first thing you need to know about your contention is you really don't want to make your assessor go hunting for it. You don't want to, you don't want your assessor to breeze or skim read through your introduction and have to go back over it to try and find where your um, where your contention is. For this reason, I think it's. I mean, different teachers will do it in different ways. Um, I used to say that you either put your contention at the front or the, the starting sentence of your piece or you put it at the end. So it's obviously, it's, it's very clear, clear as to whereabouts it is, not in the middle. I think in hindsight, um, well for some reflection, I think that maybe even better would be at the, at the start. That way you're beginning with your overall perspective um, and of course you include the title of the text. and and the author slash playwright's name in there as well. So the last thing you want to do is um, make, it m make it more difficult for your assessor to find out how you, uh, where you've answered the question in your piece. Um, the other thing that we don't want to do is simply regurgitate the essay topic. Now anyone who can um, mimic uh, symbols with fine motor skills of their hands and writing on paper can rewrite the essay topic onto the page. Anyone can do that. Um, monkeys could probably do that. Now, the idea is that you are going to actually convey a more complex understanding of the text than a monkey. So 
you would do that by showing an understanding of the essay topic rather than regurgitating it. Generally speaking, and this is said every single year at the Meet the Assessors, um, this is, this is you know, it was taught to me when I was in Year 9 and every single year after that, back in the, the old days where we didn't even really understand what text response essays were. Um, one of the most basic things is that a, a text response essay question uh, should provide you an opportunity to disagree with it somewhat or agree with it somewhat. So finding in a unique perspective on that essay topic. So you're not, you don't completely swallow it whole, you don't completely agree with it, you don't completely reject it and disagree with it. You try and find some medium ground or find some kind of unique perspective on that particular essay question. Um, you certainly don't regurgitate it. You might use some of the key terms from it. You might. The other possibility is that you use synonyms for those key terms. The advantage of using synonyms is that you actually get to show that you understand it. By using a synonym instead of the key term, you actually showcase that you understand that particular um, concept, which is important. So it's an easy way to do that. That said, you can use some of the key terms. What you will certainly not do is repeat phrases, and what you'll never ever do is repeat the whole sentence. Okay, and this is the other one here, which is tricky, because you do want to showcase that you're clever. You want to showcase that you are able to convey something that's quite complex. But you also don't want to make it overly convoluted, overly, like, uh, I guess, what my English teachers used to say about my work was that it was wordy, um, just unnecessarily complex. So the idea is that, I mean, one of the measures of good writing anyway is that you need to get rid of any extraneous words. So if a word is too fancy, then don't use it. If, a word, if you have an extra word that doesn't actually add something significant to the sentence, you just get rid of it and you find a better word or you just get rid of it completely. So clarity is the most important thing to, to achieve with your writing. To say what you mean is actually really hard and that is the primary skill of language. That's the primary function of any language is to convey meaning. So that's the, the aim. Clarity is number one. Complexity is number two uh, and important but less important, and you, ideally, best case scenario, you know, nine or ten responses are actually able to achieve both of these. If you're pushing up towards a seven, just go with clarity. If you're sitting on an eight, clear is great. Look at that, I rhymed. Um, but you, you, when you're pushing towards nine or ten, you want to add some, some kind of complexity to it without making it overly complex. I'll give you an example of what I mean. So here are some bad examples of contentions. Um, topic is, does Shakespeare suggest that Falstaff is simply a coward? Now, if I was dissecting this with a class, I would look at some of the key terms here. So the idea that uh, Falstaff being simply a coward, I think, is the idea. Maybe suggest might be worthy of discussion. You might say that he suggests some things. You know, he might outright declare it. or outright declare because he doesn't speak through the text. Or you might say that he is forceful in his presentation, that false stuff. So, so you can actually dissect that word suggest. Um, false stuff's an interesting character study. Um, he's one of the most fascinating, I'll probably argue one of the most fascinating characters of Henry IV. But then you've got your two other words here. So you've got your simply, which is an interesting term. That is, that word simply there is just begging to be um, defined. It is begging for someone to come along and add complexity to it, which is kind of appropriate considering it is the word simple, which is the antithesis of complex. So to sh show complexity, you, you see the word simple and you say, fantastic, I've got uh, something that I can target here, I can anchor my complexity towards. Okay, so simply is a very loaded word in this particular 
essay topic. And then you've got the word coward. So to, to unpack this topic correctly, you have to figure out, does Shakespeare suggest, or does, is he more forceful, or is he um, completely neutral? So you have to kind of find a perspective on that. You have to find a perspective, is, um, is, it, a, is it a case of simplicity? No. So how complex is it? Is it, um, it, how many different facets are there to this character? Um, and then you've got to look at the idea of being a coward. Is he a coward? To what extent is he cowardly? What is the function of his cowardice? What purpose does it serve? So there's a lot to look at there, which is why contention is really important. So here's some, a couple of pretty bad responses to that. Shakespeare asserts, well, I've substituted the word there, asserts for suggests. Maybe I get an extra point for that. That Falstaff is just, extra, uh, another synonym there, a coward. Okay, so that's basically a regurgitation of the prompt, though. I've basically just um, switched out two words and plonked that on the page. Pretty thoughtless. That doesn't require a lot of thinking, um, which is kind of the point of a text response essay that you actually learn to use your brain. So, no good. The next one, on the other hand, is overly convoluted. It's too wordy. And there's a couple of different reasons for that. Um, the most obvious reason for that is, look at the clause structure of this sentence. It is all over the place. Uh, it, um, it is just completely um, eclat so what, what, what I'm aiming at here is, and I'm actually doing it myself, is it clouds the meaning here. So the meaning isn't clear, it isn't succinct. So reading through, Shakespeare, throughout the entirety of the play, which is a pretty meaningless thing to say, obviously you're going to be talking about the whole play, so don't bother saying that, and in particular with the, within the subversive tavern world, okay, maybe that might be relevant. Or, it could be relevant, but it's probably not worth putting in a contention. You can put it later. Depicts the cowardly and hedonistic tendencies. Okay, by, that, by itself, they're not bad. So you've added some complexity there. You've got cowardly and hedonistic tendencies of the play's initial mentor. An, an additional detail about he's the mentor. He's the initial mentor of how? Probably not relevant to the contention. To the future studied picture. Yeah, I've got two adjectives and a noun there. Do I really need that? Of a kingly type. Well, and I'm really, I'm talking about there. How? I don't even know why I've got false stuff at the end of that. Oh, I think the false stuff is actually in reference to the play's initial mentor. And this is a, a language clarity issue here because the Falstaff should be hedged by commas after the noun that it's clarifying, which is the play's initial mentor. So it should be the play's initial mentor, comma, Falstaff, comma, to the future studied picture of a kingly type, comma, how. You can see how crap this is. You can see how, I mean, this person's just trying a bit too hard, aren't they? They're trying too hard. So what are the functional aspects of this particular contention? What are the most important parts? I'd probably say that Shakespeare, you need, and then you need a, a verb. So Shakespeare is the subject of the clause. The verb is depicts, great. So what does he depict? Shakespeare depicts the cowardly and hedonistic tendencies of Falstaff. It works, it adds complexity and it avoids all of this, not untrue material, it's, you know, this idea that he's the initial mentor to hell, it's true. The fact that it doesn't primarily through the subversive heaven world, that's true. But it's not relevant to a contention. Okay, so how are we going to make them better? Here are, hopefully, some better versions of it, where I've trimmed it back and I've been much more succinct in the delivery and in the sentence structure. So I've started the sentence, the first one, with the sentence of Falstaff himself, um, as it is a character-based uh, essay topic. So plump Jack Falstaff generates much of the play's comedy through wordplay, 
physicality and the subversion of moral convention. So, have I responded to the essay topic? That's the number one. Well, I would hear you've got subversion of moral conventions. Cowardice is a type of subversion of moral conventions. So there's a link there between cowardice and moral conventions. But what I've done is I've said that he's not, I'm not simply addressing the cowardice, I'm addressing Falstaff and all, all of the things that I think are appealing about Falstaff. I'm saying that it's his wordplay that is significant. It's his physicality that's significant. And also it's his cowardice, not just cowardice, but there are other moral conventions that he subverts as well. So it's a much broader, much more um, cohesive and complex understanding, hopefully while being quite succinct as well. The second one I've got there, Shakespearean characters are never easily categorised. So I've got this declaration, and maybe it might not take place in the um, contention itself. I might actually put that as a, as a separate part. Uh, but then I've got a colon, so I'm going to clarify what I've just said or quant qualify it. I've said Falstaff's appeal lies. So I'm talking about his appeal. Um, lies in his ability to evoke humour, pity and empathy from audiences across the centuries. Okay, so I'm talking about then this kind of universal feel of the character archetype that Shakespeare has created through uh, Falstaff, which is fairly significant. I think that's actually one of the really interesting parts of the play. Okay, so hopefully they're a bit more succinct and that shows you the kind of contention that you're aiming to develop. Now, if that seems a little bit scary. Don't stress, uh, my students will know that um, practice makes efficient. So the more you do something like this, the more you practice something like this, the easier it rolls off the tongue or rolls through the hand onto the page. Um, that's just a matter of forging neural pathways that you haven't yet and making sure that the language is ready before you sit the exam. Okay, topic sentences. Um, he, okay, so we're talking about the construction of a point of view. A contention is the overall perspective. The topic sentences should contain, and other teachers will use the term signpost, should contain, for the purposes of signposting, arguments. Now, arguments are logic, they are rationale, they are reasons. They are usually centred around an abstract noun. Um, obviously, an abstract noun is different. Concrete noun is something physical that you can touch, it's tangible. An abstract noun is something intangible, something that is usually related to a value or a view, something like feminism or love or honour, which is probably quite appropriate. So these are abstract nouns. They are intangible, they are conceptual, and therefore useful for our topic sentences. That's why I encourage students to develop an understanding of the key abstract nouns or values that relate to the text, because what you can end up doing is writing practice paragraphs on those abstract nouns, on those values, and then using those values as your topic sentences. Okay, so these are some, some examples of topic sentences without arguments that don't work. These things don't work. These are bad examples of topic sentences. And the idea here is that the, this student has simply come along and they've plonked something easy at the start of their paragraph. The classic thing that students do is plonk a character at the start of the paragraph and then try and unpack that character in all of its complexity in relationship to the prompt. I recommend not doing that, and I'll show you an alternative to that soon. Now, I'll be clear, I'm not saying don't use characters in your topic sentences. I think you can use top, uh, characters in your topic sentences, but what you want to do is make sure that the emphasis, not on the character, but on the idea. Okay, so the first topic sentence here, the audience is presented with an example of effective rule at the beginning of the play. Okay. The problem with this topic sentence is in one of the words here, it says example. Now we know from Teal that examples don't go at the start of a paragraph. Examples go in the middle of a paragraph 
an example is the whole the whole function of the of an example is that it justifies an idea it's an example for an idea an example to support an argument so the the argument goes first and then you use the example to support it there's no argument in this topic sentence the audience is presented no example of, of effective rule well effective rule is part of the contention so the idea, so there's no um, reason that's being provided in this topic sentence. There's no argument. Okay, second one. Henry is an effective ruler. Well, that might be the case, but it doesn't explain how he's an effective ruler. It doesn't explain why he's an effective ruler. It simply kind of plonks that character at the start of the sentence and then puts the contention next to it. You need to explain why or how. In contrast, full stuff is not an effective ruler. And obviously we know that full stuff, well, you can, you can maybe explore the idea that he's the ruler of the tavern world, but um, that doesn't do that. And B, there's no idea there. There's no reason why full stuff is not an effective ruler. There's no abstract noun, there's no idea, there's no argument. Lastly, hell is not an effective ruler yet. Well, at least we got that right. So it's, he becomes a future effective ruler, but still no reason, no logic. So in contrast, hopefully these are improved topic sentences. And what I've done here is I've particularly targeted a how question with these. So I've got a literary device, an abstract noun, and I've even included a character in most of them. Okay, so, so you see here the play is set in a shaken England as the law of inheritance has not been obeyed. I just want to point out, if you have a look at that topic's first topic sentence, and this first topic sentence. It's the same kind of thing. I'm talking about how the play starts, but I've used an idea and I've used a device. So instead of the audience is presented with an example of effective rule at the beginning of the play, I've said the play is set. Set is setting, which is a literary meta language, in a shaken England as the law of inheritance has not been obeyed. I've given a reason as to why um, my contention is true. Second one. Again, I've followed the same model as before. Instead of just plonking Henry in there, I've said despite this, and despite the fact that England is shaken, Henry establishes his position as monarch through his characterization as a skillful and altruistic politician. So I'm discussing the idea that he is an expert politician and why there's the ideas and I've got underlined there I've got that device by the way don't underline the device I've just underlined it for your, for your understanding uh, topic sentence three four stuff's characterization again the device represents the archetypal which is a Jungian term character archetypes don't worry about it just use the word archetypes archetypal lord of misrule contrasting the effective rule of Henry IV by personifying hedonistic values. We've got three devices in there, which I'll discuss. And what is the idea? Hedonistic values. That's the kind of thing that I'm going to be exploring. Lastly, Hell's character arc, which is a, which is a literary term, mimics a prodigal reformation and heights over the idea of prodigal reformation and heights the political skill of this future king. So I'm talking about Prodigal Reformation as a vehicle of political um, acumen. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a synopsis of how to go about this. Um, it's not that hard. Uh, all you need to do, so all I've got here is I've got a list of uh, devices. I've got a list of views or values from the text. I've already made my list of abstract nouns. I've already made my list of devices. I've already linked a few of them together. And... I already have them ready before I go into the exam. I've got them already linked and paired so that when I go into the exam, I look at it and I go, I've already got four paragraphs in my head that relate to this device, that idea, and I can apply it to that prompt. And the skill is in applying it to the prompt. So a lot of this is actually very practicable, which is why we get you to practice. Okay. Topic sentences for how could I look specifically at this um, uh, this is an example of a topic sentence for a how question. 
And generally, the structure of it is you want to say literary device shows the viewer value or central concern rated attention. And you've seen me do a little bit of that now, but here's another example. Um, character foil, strengths inherent in Hal, future king of England, Hotspur's ineffectual leadership. Cool. So it's that character contrast between those two foils. Okay. Um, another thing that we need to do, make sure that we do is that if we assert something about the text, we must have evidence from it. So we've got our reason, we've got our logic, which is fantastic, that's great. But we must make sure that we also justify that with uh, example, evidence, uh, empirical, not empirical evidence to, to, to justify that. So here we've got an unjustified assertion. This, illust this is illustrated by the world of the tavern. This is just an excerpt from a student's essay where criminals live and debauched behaviour occurs. Hmm. So there's an assertion that criminals live there. Really? Justify it. I want you to prove that. Um, and debauched behaviour occurs. Okay, so what kind of debauched behaviour? And uh, I need some evidence to justify that this is the case. Though Henry wishes to maintain peace, does he? How do you know that? Where do you get that information from? Justify it. His illegal position jeopardises his illegal position. That needs to be justified. His intentions causing him to be shaken. Cool. And then we've got quite a quote at the end there. But we do need to justify the other parts of that, all those assertions. Okay, conclusions. We're, on, we're almost there. Conclusions. Um, we've got a lot of... I read a lot of bad... Uh, not bad. They're not bad. They're not bad. They're just boring. They're just a bit bland. They're just a bit banal. Um, and they generally follow this model. In conclusion, then there's a repetition of the contention, and then there's a repetition of all the topic sentences, and that's kind of the conclusion. Um, there's three bad things about that. Well, two gener generally bad things about that. First of all, don't tell me you're going to conclude, just conclude. Don't say in conclusion, don't say to conclude, don't say ultimately, just conclude. Just get rid of that and give your conclusion rather than saying you're going to give your conclusion. It's kind of like saying firstly at the start of a topic sentence. Um, you might do it in year seven, but it's a little bit um, obvious, a little bit boring at the start of a conclusion. Second, second thing is there's the, this repetition, which is, ex which is just boring to read. The, the teacher has already read your contention the teacher has already, the assessor has already read your topic sentences. We don't want to read them all strung together. What we want at the end of a conclusion is something fresh, something interesting, something maybe even rhetorical, something, um, yeah, fun to read for, for the final closing moments. This is your, kind of your chance to put the nail in, in the coffin regarding your perspective. Now, what you don't want to do regarding your point of view what you don't want to do is give new evidence or new ideas, but what you can do um, is suggest uh, how or well, in what ways this, this text has been valuable uh, across, well, in the historical context of the time and maybe even today. So, and I think the kind of questions that you might want to ask yourself now is, why is it that we value this text so much? Why is it, maybe even generally, why do we value Shakespeare? And how do we see that in the play? Why is he, above all other artists, still being studied today? And what elements of that can we see in the text? Um, why is it that Shakespeare creates a character like Falstaff, and all of a sudden, well not all of a sudden, actually across many generations, that character has become so entrenched in our understanding that um, he even exists today in people like Homer Simpson. So what is it about Falstaff that is, seems to be this universal celebration of life or, or, or what have you? And maybe even finishing with the lasting, the lasting imagery of the play. What sticks in your head? What is, the, what is this kind of, this lasting image of Henry IV? What do you think about when someone mentions the play to you? What comes to mind? and then talk about the significance of that. Okay, so an example, um, this is a different text. Uh, had to grab a hold of something else to give you a good example for a conclusion. There probably are a lot of good ones around, but I just don't have any. Um, through Will You Please Be Quiet, Please, Roman Carver, 
provides insight into the human condition. Through, though society can be, I'm not going to read it to you, you can read that yourself. But you can see here, there's this idea of talking about the reader, talking about the cultural value, and then maybe even just broadening and philosophizing a little bit about the value of that particular um, text. Cool. Okay. Last, no, it's two more things I want to do. One of them is to show you a construction of a point of view. I'm going to breeze through this pretty quickly uh, on one of the uh, exam topics from last year for Henry IV. Uh, I'm going to give you contention. I'm going to give you arguments, suggested arguments. And then the last thing I'm going to do is give you a list of um, list of literary devices or literary techniques that you might want to explore in relationship to Henry. Okay, so the play shows that there are many ways of being a rebel. Um, obviously, the idea here um, that we want to unpack, or the key terms that we want to unpack, the idea of many ways and rebellion. So we're going to look at whether or not there are many ways of being a rebel, maybe what those ways are. Yeah, that's about it. Okay. So, yes, so provocative terms or, or key terms there are many, and then ways, and then rebel. When you see the word ways or manner or how in an essay topic, what, that's, what that might be asking you to do, what you might like to do with that, is actually look at literary techniques because the ways that authors do things through a text or the ways that text convey ideas is through the writer's toolkit. So literary devices, literary mental language. Ways is a bit of a, a clue there. Okay, quickly, um, these, sorry, these are actually topic sentences, these aren't contention. So Henry IV acceptance of the crown, uh, prince say justified disruption to the law of inheritance. I'm going to look at there at law of inheritance. Um, anarchic potential of amoral hedonism. So I'm going to discuss amoral hedonism, particularly through Falstaff. Worcester and disruption to national stability. Central complication of plays narrative. So I've got technique in there as well. Vernon's compliance with the rebellion. So I'm actually going to discuss that that too. And as Vernon is a minor character, um, I'm going to just do a shorter paragraph on there um, to talk about the idea of compliance and the fact that he's executed as well. And lastly, of course, I'm going to end with the future. I'm going to end with the next, which is Prince Hal's strategy, should be strategy of redemption or redemptive strategy. Strategy of redemption talks about how virtuous... So our rebellion might be turned around for virtuous uh, ends. Okay, notice that I've actually based these paragraphs, uh, and I've started these paragraphs with character names. Uh, I, I wanted to do that to actually show you that you can do that, but you need to place the emphasis on the underlined element here, which is that I the, those ideas, rather than the character himself, him or herself, itself. Okay. Lastly, last, 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 here are some literary devices, uh, a few of them, uh, ones, all the ones that I could think of within about 20 minutes that relate to um, this particular play. Uh, I'm not going to talk about many of them. Some of them should be fairly obvious to you, characterization, character foil, soliloquy, Character arc, foreshadowing, etc. So I'm not going to talk about the obvious ones, just really briefly. Uh, I would like to talk about uh, catechism. Catechism's a great word. Actually, I think I talk about catechism in my in the other um, part of this presentation. So I'll do that later. Um, Buildings Roman narrative. Uh, you might want to Google that. Buildings Roman, a Buildings Roman narrative is a coming of age narrative. So we can actually see Henry IV as the coming of age of Hal. This is kind of where he's growing up and becoming a man. Um, you might want to use that. Uh, the extended metaphor actually traverses 
Richard II and Henry IV. That's why you might call it extended, because it is actually um, drawn out across the plays. Uh, na, 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 na. Um, and the last one I wanted to briefly mention is... Um, Oh, yeah. A wit, pun, and wordplay. Uh, just really briefly, and I think it's a nice point to finish on. The wit, pun, and wordplay of um, Henry IV, I don't know. That's the area for me that is the most fun. Um, I, I just have a lot of fun with Shakespearean wit. And I think it's a bit like a puzzle. It's a bit like this puzzle that you don't quite see how it works, you don't quite see the image, but when you start to piece things together and you start to unpack some of the language and you start to figure out what's being said, then the humour of it is so much more potent because it's required this effort from you. It's like a, a challenging but fulfilling task. It's probably, the, it's probably actually the reason why I love Shakespeare um, and I enjoy teaching Shakespeare more than I enjoy teaching a lot of other stuff because the satisfaction of getting it, and especially when it's humorous, is just so fun. It's just so good. Um, requires effort. Uh, and I think, if I have a look at the, the, the Shakespearean plays that I know well, uh, Shakespeare, even in his tragedies, has these comedic um, moments, these comedic characters, these almost cathartic relief moments. Um, and we get it fairly consistently through Henry. Uh, but it's just so much fun. And for his audience at the time, it was just so much fun. And I think that for Shakespeare, I think the reason why Falstaff is most popular, it was so popular, was this joy, joyful participation, this joyful ex exercise of uh, wit. I think Falstaff, in, in that way, represents Shakespeare's heart, this joyful participation in, in language. So I just wanted to say that to kind of, um, to close off. Okay, I'll get on to the other ones very soon, and you should have them soon. Thanks. <laughs>